you were a pretty smart kid. You're reading Harry Potter at four years old and the daily newspaper at five. At eight, you were solving Rubik's Cubes. But at 10, you went out in public as a Hooters girl for Halloween. And I was wondering what the genius thinking was behind that one. That was a genius marketing play back in fourth grade where I had to make some kind of, it was probably an impression on one of the girls. So I went to a Episcopal private school, all that. And the look on some of those mom's faces when I showed up in that Halloween costume, that's hilarious. Where'd you find that on my old, old Instagram? Uh, I don't know. Or maybe my, my mom's secrets. Instagram. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. No, that was, I don't know, some kind of 4d marketing play back in the day, but that one, that that picture is going to find its way around the internet for a long time. <laughs> it's a classic for sure. Um, speaking of genius, I noticed this email from Craig Clemens that you guys posted recently. Uh, it's funny. I'd actually dug it up from the past. So I was a little angry when you guys reposted it, <laughs> but I dug it up and it's uh, it said, not sure why, but I feel like you two should just know each other. You're just going to have to trust me and this unsolicited cold intro. Please find a time to connect. So this was an email from Craig Clemens introducing you and Nicholas Cole, your business partner. Uh, what an amazing, amazing piece of history for you guys. And I, I was hoping you could reflect a little bit on your relationship with Cole and how your life has changed since you guys met. Wow. So today is October 11th, 2023. And so if you check the date on that email, it's October 11th, 2020. So exactly three years ago, as we were, are recording this, we are recording it from the shipyard, our brand new production studio. And I've been thinking a lot about the last three years and revisiting that story and that introduction because it almost didn't happen. I still remember when I was sitting down to Zoom with Cole. So if, for anyone without context on that email, I was doing some writing for Craig Clemens at the time. And kind of working underneath him, learning a bunch of his different copywriting techniques I was trying to learn at the time. And Cole was also mentored by him. He introduced us because I was writing, picking up the habit. I was still working at BlackRock at the time. And Cole had been a friend of his for a while and had just published The Art and Business of Online Writing. And I remember I had three or four meetings for BlackRock that day at like 9, 10, 11, 12. And I had a call with Cole scheduled, scheduled at 1. And I almost canceled it. It's one of those things where it always sounds good to take a call with someone until you're 30 minutes before. You're like, why did I schedule this thing? I don't even know this guy. What are we going to talk about? But I remember taking it and we clicked right away because we had very similar backgrounds in gaming. He mentioned that he played professional World of Warcraft. I was like, dude, I played RuneScape and Call of Duty for more hours of my life than any other thing that I've ever done. And that started what has been really a three-year journey working together. So we eventually partnered up officially in January of 2021. I spent the next year and a half working two jobs full-time at BlackRock while also building Ship 30 with Cole on the side, and then left that a little over a year ago. So March 22, we're recording this September 23. And to think of all the events that have happened over the last three years, all pointing back to that single email that I almost didn't respond to and then almost didn't take the Zoom call. A lot of lessons in there, but uh, it's hard to reflect on that three-year journey without one, getting a little bit emotional and two, just getting extremely excited about if that much can happen in three years, what could happen in 20 working together? Yeah, it's the classic, like you underestimate what you can do uh, in 10 years or you overestimate what you can do in a year, that kind of thing. So it's like the three-year journey is like, you guys have done so much and, uh, it is a great kind of culmination to have you sitting in the shipyard right now, as we do this on the three-year anniversary, uh, you mentioned RuneScape and, uh, that being a big part of growing up and just, um, you know, I, I was obsessed with Counter-Strike for about 20 years. Uh, it taught me a lot of transferable skills actually with uh, regards to leadership and communication and teamwork and dedication. And I was curious how video games have kind of played a role in your life and, and maybe as your, in your success as a businessman. I use more frameworks and lessons and skills built playing hundreds of hours of RuneScape far more than I use my Ivy League computer science degree on a daily basis. Mm. Why? 
I could go on. I do want to do a long form post on this because everything video games teach you to, to then transfer to an internet business, it's basically the same thing, except now instead of, you know, playing an imaginary game, you're playing something in the real world. So I would say the number one thing, and Cole and I use this metaphor a lot, where when you're playing a video game, you learn how to do boring, monotonous things every single day for a long period of time. If you are leveling up your character, it's something as simple as, we call it slaying boars. So I didn't play World of Warcraft, but in World of Warcraft, they had these simple characters or simple monsters you could slay called boars. And you could just sit there and level up all day. It would take way longer than a lot of other things, but it was a very clear roadmap. If I wanted to get to here, I needed to slay 200 of these. And so we communicate internally that our income, our success as a business, our success as individuals is directly tied to the amount of boring, monotonous work you can stomach. And so we call it slaying boars, where we go into something that we know is going to be the 150th time we've done it, we sit down, we do that boring work. That's the number one thing. A apart from that, building skills of working with other people, exploring different quests, the meta thing of you have all these different skills that you could go build, which one am I going to work on today? And how can I mix that up over time? So I say... Building an internet business is really the same exact thing as playing a video game, but it's been a lot of fun, both of them. And it's kind of like we are in a video game, right? I mean, the whole thing's a simulation anyway. So it, there's so, and I think that's why they're so addicting because it's like, it reflects real life so clearly. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about kind of going into your journey into Twitter. And I want to rewind to September, 2020. Um, you're posting threads, you're talking about all these different podcasts, and then Naval picks up one of them and it goes viral. And uh, there was a funny, I was looking at it and I saw one of the replies was from Sean Puri. I don't know if you remember. He said, this is the second time Dickie Bush has delivered value for me on Twitter one more time and I'll Venmo him $5. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of cool. But what, what, are the role, what has been the role of thread writing in your, not just Twitter journey, but your writing journey? So... Backing up September 2020, I'd been writing online for nine months. I came into 2020 as a whole saying, I'm very certain that the path I was on working for BlackRock, Wall Street, finance, New York City was not one I wanted to stay on forever. But I wasn't naive enough to think that I should just quit that job and go all in on something else. So I picked a middle ground where I was continuing to, continuing to work that full-time job, but I was going to write a newsletter and a blog every single week for 52 weeks because I figured... I'm doing all this personal growth work. I should start to share it. Worst case, I better understand the idea's best case, which is exactly what happened. I meet a bunch of people. I have new opportunities. I eventually chart the path for me to leave Wall Street. So that's what I did. And that was kind of the conventional playbook most people said to follow. You should own your platform. You should write on a blog. You should publish weekly. You should spend a lot of time on every single post. I did all that. And nine months in, September 2020, I had 100 newsletter subscribers, you know, 100 blog readers on every post that I would spend hours every single Sunday <laughs> slaving away. And I think 20 of those were my mom refreshing them. So the, I did not have an audience at the time. And I was extremely frustrated. So I started to write on Twitter instead, where I was taking the same ideas I was putting in my newsletter, but putting them on social platforms. And like you said, I spent 30 days writing 30 threads of podcasts that I was listening to. Again, worst case, I better understood the ideas and I can still today point back to a lot of the key frameworks I think about on my day-to-day -day operations to that kind of intensive learning sprint. But best case, exactly what happened, it gets picked up by the people that I was curating and talking about and then I'm getting to meet them, getting to talk to all of them. So that was the original Ship 30 cohort was, hey, I'm about to give up this writing on the internet thing as a whole. But I'm going to give it one last shot. And instead of following the advice that I think a lot of people recommended at the time, luckily that's changed. And I think Cole and I have had a, a pretty good wave of pushing people in this direction. I was going to publish it on social platforms. So that's what I did. That was three years ago now where I was writing Twitter threads back then. And they've really been the foundation of my writing journey this far. Threads actually played a huge part in my journey as well. Uh, when I first started on Twitter, I was writing a lot of these like deep research crypto threads. And it kind of like put me on the map right away. Uh, a lot of like multimedia and thread writing. And I always hated writing, but there was something about like the 
the forced compartmentalization and the character limits that really enabled me to kind of tap into something different and push through that. And now I actually enjoy a lot of the long form writing, uh, which I want to talk to you about because you guys sent out an email newsletter last week that said Twitter threads are dead. That was the subject line. And you were referring to these long form posts, these uh, more than 280 character posts that you can write now on X. Um, I've loved them. The algorithm loves them. Apparently they, they are great for personal stories. I'm curious your thoughts on this new format. And then particularly, how do you see them in comparison with the atomic essays that you guys push with ship 30? So let's pause and step one step back on threads, because I do think there's a meta framework here where you mentioned that they played a huge role in your journey. That's how we were connected was I saw your thread that talked about how you've been dialed in over the last six weeks or six, eight weeks or something like that. And then you wrote some curation threads on Cole and I's podcast. That was exactly how I got my start. I was curating the people in front of me that I looked up to were worst case. I got to learn and distill their ideas. Best case, I got to become friends with them. So you mentioned that thing with Sean. That was three years ago. That was way before my first million blew up. So I got to know Sean a little bit back then. It's been awesome to see what he's done. And for anyone considering writing on the internet, that is by far the most important part because we wouldn't know each other if you hadn't posted all those threads. Cole and I wouldn't know each other if we hadn't been writing. You can look at tons of people who've connected from Twitter or X because of putting those ideas out there. So I wanted to just put a pin in that because if you're sitting there consuming all the time, not unlocking the real upside of the internet, it's because you're not putting yourself in a position to be found by other people. Look at all your recent success. It's because six months ago, the, the success you're having now with spaces, with making friends, with kind of blowing up, it's because of that foundation that you put putting a high quality thread out every single day. So I like to just put a pin in that and make sure people recognize the importance of it doesn't really matter what the medium is, right? We could get into the tactics about threads or long form posts or atomic essays, but none of that matters unless you are consistently putting something out every single day. I think about that on all platforms as I expand to Instagram and LinkedIn. The first thing I do is, okay, I'm going to post something every day. Great. Now I have that new constraint. You mentioned with threads, having that 280 character constraint allows you to write more concisely. It's a nice forcing function. I think a lot of people, before they begin to publish on any platform, they don't have that publishing constraint where I need to put something out. So it's like, oh, what do I publish? The easiest one is just one thing per day. Now make sure you put that thing out. And that's why we recommend in Ship 30, you write and publish an atomic essay every day for 30 days. It could have been a Twitter thread. It could have been a LinkedIn post. It could have been something. But for most people, that gets them out of their own way immediately. They go, okay, now I know. I got to show up and write something every day. I better figure out what it is I'm going to write about. So a couple meta points I wanted to touch on there before going into some of the tactical stuff because a lot of people get too caught up in that tactical stuff when instead what really matters is you show up every day, you're publishing something, and you're building the relationships like you've done such a good job doing. Awesome. Yeah. So how do you compare that? Are, are they like in, in like tandem with each other or are they kind of opposed to each other with uh, writing kind of long form? Because that was the beauty of the atomic essay, right? Is to be able to expand longer and now it's kind of built in. And I just wonder if, if that conflicts. It's built in, but you still need to provide your own constraints, right? So for example, I am publishing a long form post with media pretty much every single day right now. But I'm still saying I want it to be under 800 words or 400 words or 250 words. You have to create some kind of constraint because you look at the new long form publishing on, on X, it's a blank page, like a blank canvas. You could write as long as you possibly want it. Now, importantly, the reading experience is not that great. So I don't think ultra long form, like if I was going to help Elon, I'd say, hey, there needs to be a couple things like you can engage with certain parts of the post to say, hey, this part got my attention. You should be able to double tap and like at any moment, right? Because I think it's actually leading to lower engagement when you're reading the whole thing. But again, these are kind of the nitty gritty tactical. It's pick any time that there's a potential place to publish, add some constraints for yourself. So for me, that's every day right now. And that's a certain number of words. I haven't really settled on it, but it's around 500. Got it. 
And you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the double tap. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but in the last couple of days, Elon said that they're going to be removing retweets, likes, and comments, and the numbers on the main feed to kind of clean up from an aesthetic point of view. It's only going to show impressions and you'll be able to double tap to like and swipe to comment. Uh, that's something they're working on. So I don't know, just if this is the, is this the first time you're hearing of it? And if so, kind of like, what's your initial reaction to that? Will that change the way that we interact with posts on the feed? I think I saw him mention it, but here's my entire MO. This is a broader framework for life, but I'll tell you a, a quick story. So I played football in college and after one of our practices, it was a horrific rainy afternoon and mud everywhere. We're all kind of like, we don't, no one really wanted to be there for that Thursday practice or whatever. And the forecast on Saturday was a ton of rain as well. So we're all sitting there. We all knew it was going to rain on Saturday. And our, our head coach goes to one of the guys. He's like, hey, Stewie, what's the weather on Saturday? And we all kind of know like, oh, it's rainy. He's about to say it. And as he starts to say it, it's going to rain, coach, our coach cuts him off. He goes, it's the same for both teams. And his point there is anything that happens to everyone is an opportunity for us, right? So if it rains, we're going to take care of the ball better than them. And we're going to force turnovers. If it's a super hot day, we're going to be in better shape. We're going to take better care of our bodies. We're going to hydrate, you know, more effectively. So when I see these platform changes, there's two ways to react. It's like, oh, an algorithm change again. Woe is me. That's going to, you know, Beginner accounts are never going to be able to grow now. Or like, oh, I built this big following and now they go and change everything. But I go, oh, new long form post. Great, going to post every day and I bet I end up figuring it out. Cool. They're taking likes and comments away. Advantage for me somehow. And I treat that with everything in life or every circumstance that happens to me, I treat as an opportunity. So I love hearing, oh, they're going to change something. Why? Because most people will have a reaction of, oh no, like, well, what do we do now? And I'm just going to figure it out and keep playing. Yeah, it's like the bigger the change, the more opportunity because it just shocks the system to the people that aren't willing to put in the work. And that's actually one of the reasons I like spaces so much. There's a lot of reasons, but we've been having a lot of kind of like deep conversations about the algo, about what kind of content's working, about what's not. And you can go a lot deeper, a lot quicker than maybe, you know, having a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with someone or putting out a tweet and like reading your comments. There's like that real-time interaction. I'm actually having a space in about a 90 minutes from now with NFT God and Taylor Simmons, where we're going to be doing like workshopping long form tweets because no one's really talking about like the tactics of it. They're just saying, oh, long form tweets are the meta now. I mean, you guys actually did in your newsletter, but um, most people are not uh, really going deep. So that spaces framework is great for kind of diving deeper into the changes that will continue to happen with Elon at the helm and this this quick product shipping. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about the other end of the spectrum with some of the short form stuff and that fast feedback loop you can get there. I've heard you call Twitter an idea refinery. Can you kind of expand on that and, and why that's so powerful? Twitter is the only platform that doesn't punish you for publishing more. So 10 tweets per day does not impact your reach or your re anything. Like if you post 10 times a day on LinkedIn, it's not, you're not going to have that much success. If you post 10 YouTube videos per day, you're not going to have that much success. With Twitter, you can use it as an immediate feedback loop for your ideas. So every single day, I write something in my Apple Notes of I came across this or this story happened or here's an interesting thing I want to reflect on. And every Sunday for the last three years, I've sat down, cleared those ideas into individual tweets. That is my thinking space. Anytime an interesting event or realization or lesson happens to me, I make sure to crystallize it and I tweet it out. Immediately, that sends it into the internet where other people can interact with it. And I get feedback on how interesting was that idea or Hey, have you thought about it from this perspective? Or, hey, I'd love if you went deeper on this. And at the end of each week after that, I look back on the week before and said, okay, of those ideas, which ones do I want to double down on that have resonated? And I've spent the last three years making noise, putting ideas out there, and then doubling down on the ones that I enjoyed writing about and that people enjoyed reading. So if you're not publishing anything on Twitter, every single tweet is free upside. So you have an idea, put it out there. There's no downside to publishing more. So I was talking to some people who go, you know, oh, the algorithm's changing all this. And I said, you know what the solution is? Post way more.
get more data on what's working. It's the only way you're going to figure that out. So I put a tweet out of, hey, if I was a beginner right now, I'd be posting 10 times a day. I'm sitting around 400,000 followers and I'm tweeting six times a day on average. And so people are like, oh, I'm posting twice. I'm like, you just, you got to up the volume. So I think a platform like Twitter, get as many ideas out there and then double down on the ones that you find are working. How do you like put your head into the process so much like that, where it's like, it's about the inputs rather than getting stuck in this engagement prison, because I feel like a lot of people have that. Uh, I do sometimes where I'm like, oh, I want to put that out, but it's probably not going to do that well. How do you like, mm. how do you mentally compartmentalize that? You have to disconnect the external validation from the publishing. It's still important, but if you think you should never not publish something because you don't think it's quote unquote going to do well, you should say, I'm going to figure out if it does well. How many things I published that I didn't think were going to do well that ended up going viral, I can't even name because that's how many of them there are. So you have to disconnect because at the root of it, it's not that you don't think it's going to do well. It's that you're worried that you're going to publish something that's going to get low engagement that then other people are going to see and then judge you for it. So it's, oh, I don't want to post this because like, I don't know if people are going to like it. No, at the root of that is you're worried people might not like it. And then other people will see that you publish something that people didn't like. I have tweets all the time now that get under 100, 100 likes or 40 likes or something like that because the algorithm just kills them. And I could have two reactions. I could go and scramble and delete them and say, oh, I can never talk about that idea again. Or I can go, great, good thing I tweeted six more times today. And these three have 1,500. I'm going to go think about those ideas. So it's kind of a, you have to figure out the mental games you need to convince yourself of. Because if you're worried that you're going to put something out and it's going to get no engagement, and then everyone's going to somehow see that, that you got no engagement, that's impossible. So... Uh, you know, people get in their own way too much. I'm like, oh, I can't do it because people might not like it. It's post enough where you're not ever wrapped up in the individual post results. Yeah, I think Chris Williamson from Modern Wisdom said something similar about podcasting. He was like, people are scared to start a podcast because they think everyone's going to see it and it's going to suck. And he's like, if no, if your thing sucks, no one's going to see it. That's kind of like the entire point. So um, yeah, you nailed it with that. And uh, I, I want to touch on something, you know, when people are putting out a lot of ideas in the beginning to see what sticks a lot of times, especially in the, the early going, it's to figure out like, what do I want to talk about? What is my niche, right? This is like the biggest problem for beginning writers on X. And there's a quote that I know you like from Richard Feynman that is nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Can you explain that quote a little bit with regards to finding the things that you want to talk about and maybe how you use that framework or idea to figure out where you wanted to go with your content early on? It's a great quote. And I remember thinking about that a lot during my initial publishing. So back up to September of 2020, when I was doing a lot of this publishing, it was I'm trying to figure out what is it that I actually like to write about? Well, the easiest way to figure that out is conduct what we call the two-year test, which is you look back on your last two years or two months or two days or two decades and say, what are all the things that I've learned, life transitions I've made, hobbies I've built, skills I've started, X, Y, Z. And that is kind of your raw material where most people get into a place of writing and they think they need to come up with all these brand new ideas. But the most lucrative writing you could possibly do is just to talk about the things that you've already done, which often means you're going to share ideas that have become painfully obvious to you, but are now incredibly novel to other people or your former self who would have done anything to have access to the ideas in the form that you know them now. I say all that because you're not figuring out what your quote unquote niche is or what all this it's what do you like to talk about and who do you want to help? That's it. Who do you want to read your stuff? That's your niche. People go, oh, I like, no, it's if you were conducting an event and you could invite 100 people, what 100 people would you invite? And then what would you talk about? And Twitter gives you the opportunity to host a different event with every single post. It's like, all right, today I'm going to try health and fitness event. Let's see if anyone's interested in coming. If I could host that, I'd love for these people to come. They'd all be keto diet crossfitters. 
and they'd let you know if they were keto diet CrossFitters, definitely. But okay, cool. I'm going to talk about those and see if there's anyone interested in that. Great. There were, I didn't really like talking about it. I've said everything I need to say. So that initial exploration phase that I was on was, I discovered was not necessarily a specific topic, but a specific avenue to learn. So my quote unquote niche has been for three years talking about whatever it is I was working on building at the time. So in 2020, I was trying to learn how to write. So I talked about that a lot. Right now, I'm learning how to operate and scale an internet business. So I've started to talk more and more about that. When I was on my weight loss journey, I talked about that. When I was on my general biohacking journey, I talked about that. Where the easiest thing to do is do things offline and talk about them online. You can have a remarkable amount of success if you just do those two. But most people go, oh, all this stuff offline, one, they're not doing enough of it. And two, all the things they are doing, they don't think they're qualified to talk about for whatever reason. So that's my overarching framework is figure out what you're doing, talk about it. The people that are interested in those things, the internet is, its job, these social platforms, is to show your content to those people. So you just kind of trust them and the rest really takes care of itself. Mm, I love that. And with you in particular, I think one of the, the through lines through all the things that you did talk about is growth, right? You love growth, whether it's personal growth or business growth or whatever it may be, even market growth when you were with BlackRock, like you're always looking at the way that things work and how to hack them and things of that nature. Um, you have this concept of like growing up versus growing down. Can you distinguish between these two, like the material success uh, and, and getting to know yourself and, and kind of how you balance those? Hmm. I'm actually, where did I write about that framework? I heard you talk about it in a podcast. So it was kind of like growing up is like the material success that you achieve in your life. And growing down is really like rooting into your being and getting to know yourself better and, and, and Hmm. doing all the things that you need to do personally. Huh? Okay. I don't remember talking about that framework, but I like (laughs) it. So let me, let me pull on that thread because there are two different types of growth. It's the growth that other people experience you as, and then it's the internal growth of how you experience yourself. So Five years ago, coming up on six, I was 100 pounds heavier. I was drinking 40 beers a week. I was tens of thousand dollars in student debt. My mom had just been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and I was going to work a job on Wall Street for 90 hours a week. Six years later, I'm in a completely different spot across every single one of those areas. For people who meet me now, they don't know that that was my spot in my journey back then. So it's a completely different, I come off in that way. At the same time, the I heard Mark Manson put beautiful words to this, and it's that your identity lags other people's reality by about two to three years. So when you have a big physical change, a big financial change, a big emotional change, you're still how you have remembered yourself for the 20 years that came before that. Whereas every person new you meet now has this new identity of you there's that misalignment there. So most of personal growth, the physical side, the financial side, all of that external facing stuff is not that difficult. It's kind of follow a roadmap. The more difficult part where there is no roadmap is getting your internal alignment to catch up to that change that you've made. So that's far more where I place a lot of my efforts right now. Like everyone knows how to get in shape. And if you follow the directions on the box, you're going to get in shape. But are you going to necessarily embody the belief of a healthy, lean athlete when you were 100 pounds overweight? Not as quickly as you're going to make that physical change. And so that's really the foundation of personal growth on all fronts is getting that internal state to match when that external state where it's much easier and more straightforward to accomplish. Mm. I've I've found social media and content creation to be a massive lever for personal growth for me. And I know, you know, like, and listening to podcasts and all this stuff as well, just like being consumed by all these different forms of inputs and outputs and the internet itself. I know at one point you had listened to every single Tim Ferriss podcast. I don't know if that's still true to this day uh, with how busy you are, but uh, I've listened to a lot of them, not all of them. His interview with uh, Balaji change the way I look at the world. Uh, one of the earlier ones that he did with him. Uh, what have been some of your biggest takeaways from 
Tim Ferriss and that podcast. Yeah, man. I wrote a ton about that. I've not listened to every new episode, but during that formational period, I clicked with him because we went to the same college. We had similar experiences in college, I think, where there was a little bit of not dissatisfaction with the roadmap, but it was a little bit like, oh, this was all it was cracked up to be kind of thing. And I just clicked with his experimentation and obsession. So you mentioned it in the first 10 seconds of this podcast, but my life trajectory has been finding something new to obsess on, obsessing over it for a lot, a lot of time, and then kind of moving on to the next thing. And I had studied his path and he's done that. Like he was a world-class tango enthusiast. He's done all these other weird tricks and whatever. And it was interesting to hear his experimental lens for all of that. So some of the more tactical things was I followed his slow carb diet for a lot of my weight loss journey. I followed his health and fitness. I listened to the way that he writes. If you really dig into, I, I've wrote a summary thread of everything he said about writing. Cause I was like, okay, this guy's published books differently than other people. How could I pay attention to it? So I just loved geeking out on the fact that he was getting access to these world-class people. He would ask such good questions to get the good stuff out of them. And when I was on that kind of blank slate life reorientation of I spent 25 years or 22 years following this traditional path. And now you get thrown into the real world with no <laughs> bumpers on the, the bowling alley. Like you're going to have to figure this stuff out. So I dove into his world and some of the others like Naval and Derek Sivers and these other people that I look up to where I was like, what are these guys who seemingly have what I would eventually like think about the world and immersing myself in the worldview went a long way for me. And I still think about those frameworks all the time. Yeah. I love, I love this idea of like finding mentors online that you don't even know, but they become so personal to you because of the content game. Like we've just never had this before. It used to be maybe just someone wrote a lot of books would probably be the closest you could get, or they'd done a couple of interviews on TV, but now it's everyone's putting out stuff every day and their ideas are evolving and you can soak it in and I know like Eckhart Tolle and Gary Vaynerchuk and Jordan Peterson over the course of my life have become like mentors to me in different stages of my growth. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about like leveling up personally from like uh, a masculine and a, a fatherhood and a um, hmm. just a man standpoint, because you said something on a podcast with Danny Miranda that I have thought about a lot and said out loud a lot, actually, which is that. Uh, the woman that I want to attract that I view to be my future wife, she's looking a little bit above me probably right now uh, that I need to like get to that stage. And you, I don't know what your romantic life is right now because there's been a gap since that podcast. Maybe you're seeing someone, but there, there is this idea that um, I'm okay with not searching for her, let's say, because even if I found her right now, she is probably looking for better than me. So I need to get up there to get that like elite woman. Does that make sense to mm. you? And can you unpack that a little bit? And how do you think about dating as like a very focused entrepreneur? So I'll start with the first question, which is, I could certainly say that everything I'm doing right now from a personal growth, from a physical growth, financial, emotional, is to set the foundation to be a world-class father. I say that because it gives a very clear mission for the way I spend my time, the inputs I pay attention to. All of that is a simple lens of, am I becoming someone who is more likely to raise a world-class family in the future? I'm not sure why 100% that's my goal, but I feel so strongly about if we're meant to do anything, it's build a family unit in some capacity. It's reproduced in some way, right? I think it's our moral obligation if we are educated individuals to do the best we can to keep the population growing. So I love that idea. And it clicks with a lot of what I want to spend my time doing. Now, if I rewind four years ago, five years ago, like I described, 280 pounds, negative net worth, drinking 40 beers, because that's what you did in college at the time, that was not very fatherly. And so if I expect myself to eventually attract someone who is attracted to me because of that potential fatherly 
opportunity and dynamic and everything that goes into that. Well, I clearly had a lot of work to do. So that was really how I spent my last four or five years. And it's still how I'm spending my time. It's I'm continuing to level up because I know that the rest takes care of itself. When you are focused on some kind of mission of personal improvement, where it's always operating from a place of abundance versus scarcity, right? If you're like sitting there at age 27, like got to go find a wife, got to go find a wife, not going to end up well for you. But if it's like, Hey, I kind of have my own game I'm playing here and I'm, I'm figuring out this, I'm learning jujitsu, I'm, you know, traveling, I'm doing all these interesting things. The person you're eventually going to want to attract is going to be attracted to that. It's not that they're attracted to, you know, you walking up to them on the street. It's wow. This person is, clearly driven by something bigger that is cool to me and so that's been my thinking on it in general so that's uh i don't know if that answers your question it does it's it's this commitment to personal growth with the trusting that the universe has your back with things like women and family like if that's a if that is uh intentional and the you're part of your why then as you start to grow, those things will naturally be attracted to you. And, you know, throughout any of our lives that, I mean, that's just kind of what happens if someone just pops up at some time and, and you want to be the best version of yourself for that moment that you'll be able to capitalize. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I respect that and resonate with it, which is why I wanted to ask. Um, and I, you know, finally, I want to ask about the shipyard, which we've talked about this amazing studio that you're sitting in right now. Um, honored to, to be interviewing you in it. And, uh, can you explain a little bit like what it is, what it represents and what you're most excited about with all of your businesses going forward as you look into the future? The shipyard was our investment in ourselves that we've spent three years validating the ideas and frameworks and techniques and strategies that we've shared. And by definition, the number of people interested in those things that we can reach is limited if it's only on text platforms. So if we feel as passionate as we do about the power of writing on the internet, we actually need to go reach people who are not writing on the internet, meaning video, Instagram, YouTube, those kind of platforms. So we said last year, we tried to dabble in it and we started to make a couple YouTube videos and we understood that to play the game of YouTube at the level that we expect to requires a significant investment where Twitter in any text platform, there is no barrier to entry. But YouTube, there kind of is, where we're going to get a lot more attention on our videos just because of what's behind me. The same exact words in your setup versus mine right now, it's going to be different. And we understood that. So we actually took a year and said, we're not ready for YouTube yet. Let's go continue to validate, validate our ideas. Let, let's go grow some other businesses that have allowed us to be in a fortunate position to invest in taking this next step for us. So in terms of what's going to change, not much in terms of what we have for sale. It's just the way we communicate the ideas and the number of people we're able to reach and the awareness of those people that we're going to reach. That's what's going to change. So I have not been as excited to wake up every single morning and work on the things that I'm working on right now than I ever have. Cole and I basically unlocked a new video game. It's let's go play the YouTube and Instagram game. Let's figure out how to make a high quality video podcast. Let's figure out how to look good on camera. You know, this setup does a lot, a lot for us in terms of that. And that's a, a hard problem to solve. So that's the high level is we're about to take our content and everything that we've said in written form and turn it into videos. And we don't think there's anyone who's going to be able to do a similar level of investment into their content. I don't think there's anyone who is able to articulate the ideas. It's one thing to write about them when you can look at what someone else has written, but it's another thing to articulate them in a coherent way. So I think that's going to allow us to continue to differentiate the frameworks that we have. And yeah, I haven't been, like I said, this excited in a long, long time. I'm excited for you guys. And I know that you're looking for a world-class video editor to come and help you with your, uh, your entire YouTube strategy. So if anybody listening uh, is an expert in YouTube and in video editing, please reach out to Dickie and Cole. And uh, listen, man, I absolutely love everything you guys are doing. I've been a huge fan ever since I came across your work. And I've been honored to get to know you a little bit over the last few months. Uh, I'm super excited to watch how you guys evolve and support you. 
And I just want to thank you for coming on the show. And also, secondly, if you have anywhere that you want to uh, point people, that would be great. But um, if you could leave people with just any kind of encouragement or lasting thought that's something that's been on your mind recently uh, in terms of growth, in terms of content, whatever's kind of resonating with you, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, the podcast I did earlier this week, they asked a final question of if you could leave someone with one tweet. And to me, it's this idea of killing your onces. So in your life, there's always going to be a once. Once I leave my job, once I move cities, once my kid goes from age two to age five, once I feel ready to get started. Those onces are always going to hold you back from being on the other side of once I, then I'll blank. And I've spent my entire life more so in the last couple of years, identifying those onces and killing them the second I hear them. So once I feel comfortable leaving my job at BlackRock, then I'll quit. Nope. If I'm not there yet, those onces are never going to go away. So the second that one thing goes away, you'll have a new once. So anytime you find yourself saying, once I blank, then you need to stop and do that thing immediately. Because there will never, never be a perfect time to start anything, which means the only time logically to get started then is right now. That's my lasting piece of advice for, for everyone. If you want to find out more about me, I'm at Dickie Bush. I spend too much time on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram there. It's all one word. Uh, if you're interested in starting to write online, we have a free 13,000 word ultimate guide at startwritingonline.com. And if you're interested in ghostwriting, you can go to premiumghostwritingblueprint.com. Both of those are free five-day email courses that'll kind of give you a crash course in those entire worlds if those are interesting to you. All those links will be in the description. Dickie, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It was a pleasure. Greg, thanks for having me, brother. And congrats to you on all your success. I'm excited to keep watching you as you grow the pod, as you grow the podcast network, as you grow the spaces. It's cool to see the momentum that you have. So I know we'll look back on this interview in a year, two years, three years and say, Greg's gone and done X, Y, and Z. So I'm excited for you as well.